Hello, and welcome everybody to today's webinar, Connect Research and Practice in Your Social Work Program, presented by Springer Publishing Company and featuring Tim Hilton and Peter Forson, lead authors of the new edition of Applied Social Research, a Tool for the Human Services. My name is Kate Dimmock, and I am the editorial director responsible for the Social Work Publishing Program here at Springer Publishing Company. For those of you that aren't familiar with Springer Publishing Company, we are an independent publisher known for innovative textbooks, clinical products, and test prep in the fields of behavioral and health sciences, nursing, and medicine. Before I, I introduce Drs. Hilton and Forson, please note that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website in case you miss any part of the presentation. We will also be taking questions at the end through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please feel free to post any questions in the Q&A feature during the presentation, and we will ask them at the end of the presentation. I am pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Tim Hilton and Dr. Peter Forson. Tim Hilton is Professor and MSW Program Director at Eastern Washington University. He is a qualitative and quantitative researcher and his research and practice experience focuses on the areas of housing and homelessness, employment and training. Dr. Hilton has extensive experience in program evaluation and recently completed an evaluation of services and service gaps for homeless students and their families in Spokane County, Washington. This research led to the creation of new programs within area schools to connect families with housing services and address students' academic, social, and mental health needs. Peter Forson is Associate Professor of Social Work, Appalachian State University. He too is a qualitative and quantitative researcher focusing on domestic violence and related services, juvenile justice, and forensic social work. Dr. Forson has conducted program evaluations for the juvenile and criminal justice system in Utah and Washington state, and has developed a series of workshops at the university and community levels to raise men's awareness of their male privilege, discuss men's violence against women, and explore different ways men can help prevent and decrease all forms of violence. Tim and Peter, I will now hand the presentation over to you so you can take it away. Thank you, Kate. This is uh, Tim Hilton. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, our goals for this textbook. Uh, this textbook is now in its 10th edition. Uh, I've been working on this textbook uh, for the last two editions. From the start, uh, the focus of um, applied social research has been on the logic of research, um, highlighting parallels and intersections uh, between research and practice. Uh, the original goal, and hence the title, is to present research and um, specific research methods as tool for practice. Uh, that's to say, research is not just something that practitioners can turn to for information. It's also a way of thinking and a collection of tools they can use to help solve practice dilemmas. We emphasize that practitioners use research methods and logic uh, in posing uh, answerable questions, identifying relevant factors, uh, in assessing clients and their communities, identifying client, program, and community needs, evaluating and selecting appropriate services, uh, selecting, monitoring, and evaluating uh, client outcomes, analyzing client, program, and community data, and uh, designing and uh, selecting the best evidence-based practices. We have not strayed from those original goals. Uh, our focus remains on research processes and the use of research and practice. Uh, for this edition, in the 10th edition, we've placed uh, additional strong emphasis on applications of research um, and highlighting practitioners, uh, non-researcher practitioners, who apply research methods to address common social work dilemmas. Um, the reason we do this is to help students see that research is something that practitioners use every day uh, and is not just uh, something used by those who are particularly uh, and uniquely scientifically minded. Hi everyone, this is Peter Fawson. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, so I'm going to 
uh, talk about the current state of research. Um, before I get into that, uh, I was just going to state that this is my first edition as being an author. I have used this textbook for years, and um, I've taught research for over a decade on, from PhD students uh, down to uh, bachelors of social work. Um, one thing that we notice uh, a lot is most of the time in social work, students do not want to take research. It's a class they're reluctant to take. And because of that, there's a lot of um, either increased anxiety and fear um, and, and or, or it could be for many different reasons. Um, and so we found that research can if it taught in the right way, it can uh, decrease these types of anxieties. So many students in social work and other human service programs are just less enthusiastic about research. Um, when I start uh, teaching my research course, I'll, at the beginning of the class, I'll ask um, what are some of their fears around research and how could it get better? And what's interesting is um, they usually come up with three things. There are three main themes come out. Uh, they want a topic they are interested in to research. They want research explained in practical everyday terms and not heady research terms. And they want to learn how to apply research to the real world. And so when teaching research, there becomes a balance uh, between explaining concepts and topics and understanding terms while also teaching key research concepts. For example, the scientific method, research methods, and research paradigm. And so as we're able to do this uh, and explain it in uh, terms and, and apply terms for students, we find that this can help decrease their anxiety. Um, what we hear from our students, mostly before a research course, I you know I just kind of talked a little bit about when they started, but here it is, research is hard. I've always been bad at science and math, so I'm gonna be bad at research. I'm good with people, just bad at research. Uh, research won't help me in my job. And so one thing we wanna do and with this textbook is help uh, kind of dispel some of these uh, or help out with some of these fears that students may have. So, um, Students typically come to research with different levels of fear. Some are from previous experiences and other come from what they have heard. I, I teach research from an applied perspective and that's the perspective of this textbook and continually tie the concepts back to my research. This gives students concrete examples of how research can be applied and look in the real world. All of us are researchers. We are constantly trying to figure out how things work and how to solve problems. I tap into this concept with my students and this textbook helps do that. And this textbook addresses fears. Um, and the way that it does this is by emphasizing that research is logical and can be intuitive. Um, and one thing that I, I constantly do with my students is even though they might have all these fears about research and think they're not going to do well, I, I continually uh, give them encouragement and consistency throughout the semester. And I find that that, is, that goes a really long way. Um, by using the vignettes, the, professional, the practitioner profiles, key concepts, and the body of this textbook uh, provides students with a variety of applied approaches to uh, research in the human services. Practitioner profiles and research-based practice that helps students see real-world applications of research, and this can help calm fear and anxiety regarding uh, taking their research class. So this is Tim again. Um, we want to just just sort of continuing with this theme. Um, you know, one of the questions we get uh, from students, and um, one of the themes that we emphasize in this textbook is um, the use, obviously, the use of research and practice and how it applies uh, to uh, social work and other human services. Um, 
why do I need to study research methods when, it, when I just want a career helping people? And this is a, a question we're likely to get from students reluctant to take uh, research. Well, um, in, my, in, in, in my first lecture of any research course, um, and uh, one of the themes that we emphasize at the beginning of the textbook, um, is, is uh, the idea that social work can be and should be based on evidence and follow scientific principle, right? Uh, if we don't uh, rely on evidence to shape our services, we're merely guessing about what works and what does not work, right? Um, we stress the need for practitioners to critically examine their programs um, and their services to ask whether practices are effective. Um, and we emphasize that this should not just be left to the few of us who enjoy uh, research, uh, science and math. It isn't just something for directors and administrators. It should uh, also uh, be, be a, a prominent theme for uh, direct practitioners. Um, our clients and our communities are unique, right? We emphasize that what works in one situation may not work in all situations. And so that requires um, a critical evaluation, right? And being a, a good consumer of research. So we need to have the ability to critically examine and consider our own work. Right. Um, with our clients and in our communities, we need to ask, is this working? What is missing? And what can I do to uh, improve outcomes? Um, we also emphasize that being a good researcher isn't just uh, uh, important for effective practice, but it's also a necessary component of ethical social work. Obviously, when clients come to us, uh, they're hoping for positive outcomes. If we're not um, critically examining what we're doing and delivering uh, the most effective outcomes, we are not uh, fully committed to our clients, and that is obviously an, uh, an ethical consideration. So we emphasize uh, that as well uh, in our text. Um, we mentioned earlier that uh, uh, one of the new highlights of uh, this text is uh, further emphasis on practitioners in practice. So we, um, we conducted a series of um, uh, of interviews with uh, practitioners who use uh, research in their everyday practice. And um, I want to share just one of them. Uh, one of our interviews was a former student of mine who graduated uh, three years ago, uh, and she is a program manager with an agency in Spokane called Volunteers of America, and she is the uh, working in their Housing First program. Um, we, we uh, highlight uh, Rayanne and a practitioner profile uh, included in our evaluation uh, research chapter. Um, in, the, in our interview, uh, Rayanne describes herself as having little interest in research until recently, but has demonstrated, a key, uh, she also demonstrates a keen awareness of research uh, concepts and methods. You know, for example, um, she describes uh, the need to critically evaluate surveys and scales. Uh, the Housing First programs are around the country are using a vulnerability index scale to prioritize uh, which clients receive housing uh, with limited housing supply. And this scale is known as the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool, which is a mouthful. And Rayanne explains uh, what the tool is and, and what it does and what it doesn't do. And, and uh, here's a quote from her. She says, I've looked closely at these measurement tools and have a good understanding of how each question contributes to overall scores. I'm not sure it really does a good job of measuring vulnerability. That's why I've said it really seems to measure cost to communities of homelessness more than personal vulnerabilities of clients. I think that is what researchers said was an issue of measurement validity. To me, it's more about who gets services and who gets who does not. So, I mean, here's a, here's a quote that really demonstrates uh, a keen awareness of uh, concepts like, uh, like measurement ability. Uh, later on, um, she explains the importance of keeping accurate program data and presenting this data to landlords. Uh, in her program, she is constantly doing outreach to landlords uh, to try to create housing opportunities for her clients. Um, she writes, we've, we've recently developed a fact sheet with data from our program that shows our success across the entire program. It shows how many clients have entered housing and what percentage have remained. Uh, we include demographic data about clients and their disabilities. We also include number of violations and damages created. We let them know that this, pro this program can be successful for people with significant challenges. 
This is much more powerful than just creating one basic and sappy story showing that everything is great once a person is in housing. Landlords feel secure about the program when they see data. They feel better about leasing to us. So I, I include this here uh, in this presentation uh, just to give you an example of our practitioner profiles. And, you know, from a, a self-described uh, um, research novice and somebody who has little research, um, she's able to demonstrate that with some knowledge, um, she can use research uh, to uh, develop some, some pretty sophisticated uh, uh, research tools, to, to, to use some pretty sophisticated research tools uh, to actually uh, solve a dilemma. Hi, this is <clears throat> Peter again. Um, I'm going to talk about another practitioner profile, uh, one that uh, I interviewed. And um, I found that this was a pretty um, amazing process to go through and to be able to interview different professionals. And Kristen Harmon is the one that I've highlighted here. Um, when this was recorded for the textbook, uh, she had been a social worker, practicing social worker for 25 years as a medical social worker at Appalachian Healthcare. Uh, now it's uh, she's at, in her 26th year, and her uh, practitioner profile is featured in Chapter 15. Um, one thing that she mentioned um, was that she really did not want to take a research class. She didn't think it was going to be helpful or useful at all to her uh, once she got out into the real field of uh, social work. Um, and so she mentions she was someone who never thought she would use research in social work practice. Uh, she describes herself as someone who uses research on a daily basis through assessing clients. Uh, she also um, discusses how quantitative research in practice uh, looked at trends and client outcomes. That was one thing that she definitely used as quantitative looking at these trends, but the main uh, research she used is qualitative research, and that was through her assessing her clients. And so here I'm going to um, talk a little bit about some of the things specifically that she uh, brought up in her uh, interview. Uh, collecting information from clients while interviewing them is the best way to learn about their unique lived experience while connecting the dots between specific needs and the best resources available for that specific client. Through qualitative research, she was able to see where the gaps in clients' needs and services are and how she can better assist those needs. No assessment is the same. The use of investigative qualitative research provides her a genuine understanding of her clients' needs and experiences and allows her to use the most optimal and effective treatment specific to her clients. So for Kristen, she's obviously not doing grounded theory and hard um, qualitative research, but what she is doing is something that social workers are doing all over the country and world, and that is using the assessments uh, from clients and pulling the themes out to address specific needs. And um, I think that this is a very common, uh, her example is something very common that um, uh, many of our students will experience. This is Tim again. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the general overview of the textbook uh, by chapter. Um, the, flow of the, the flow of the textbook is similar to many research texts. Um, it begins with an overview of research and relationships between research um, and social work and other human services practice. Um, it addresses research ethics, covers identifying research problems, um, and creating research questions. Uh, we then move on to uh, measurement uh, and sampling. Uh, we also cover um, evaluation research and offer uh, many examples of uh, evaluation research, um, while highlighting differences and similarities between uh, evaluation uh, research and other uh, research. We also include a chapter on scaling, uh, two chapters on data analysis, um, quantitative data analysis, and, and an additional chapter on qualitative data analysis. Uh, the final chapter covers gr uh, grant proposal and report writing. Um, 
you'll see that there's 17 chapters. Um, and uh, we, we found that some ch uh, instructors may choose to skip some, some chapters. Uh, for example, the scaling and quantitative analysis chapters uh, may be covered in some programs and separate courses. Um, you know, for example, a data analysis uh, or a statistics uh, course. Uh, we found that the text works well for both graduate and undergraduate courses. Um, we begin our chapter sections with explanations of basic concepts, and then uh, we move into more complex uh, and nuanced materials. Um, and we found that it's relatively easy to assign readings or sections of chapters that highlight different materials uh, to different groups of students, um, you know, leaving the, the more uh, uh, nuanced material to uh, graduate. Uh, graduate students. We also found that, um, speaking with a lot of our graduates, that a lot of students keep the textbook uh, after graduation as opposed to selling it back. Uh, they find that it's useful uh, reference material. Um, you know, just recently I spoke with a, a few folks who, who told me that uh, the survey uh, chapter has been um, helpful for them in, in designing uh, survey items for uh, some evaluation work that they've been doing at their agencies. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of within the chapters, um, what, you, what you can expect. Um, we design each chapter uh, to be easy to follow while helping students and instructors identify the most important concepts. Uh, we also went to great lengths to provide examples uh, to which students could identify. Um, our chapters follow uh, similar formats. Uh, each chapter begins with a vignette uh, where we present a dilemma facing a human service professional. Right. Most of these are uh, real practitioners in real situations they have faced. Others are based on real situations and we've hide identities and changed some details um, uh, for confidentiality's sake. Uh, the vignettes are extended throughout the chapter um, and this allows us to emphasize how various aspects of research are used to address the practice situ situation. Um, each chapter also includes a practitioner profile based on uh, interviews that we conducted um, with human service professionals uh, who use research methods and practice. Again, as we've mentioned before, the goal is to help students see that research isn't just a course they have to take, but it's a tool for practice. We also hope that students become more excited about research as they see that others like them who may have been reluctant to engage in research uh, reuse research to make their jobs easier. Um, our chapters also include uh, uh, what are known as research and practice text boxes. Again, these highlight practitioners and agencies using research to address practice dilemmas. Uh, toward the end of each chapter, uh, we include uh, chapter summaries, which are organized as, as main points. Uh, we have a list of uh, key terms for review, which students uh, find helpful. Uh, we have a list of questions designed to promote critical thinking. Uh, these are um, uh, organized as essay questions or discussion uh, prompts. Uh, we also include uh, questions uh, designed to evaluate students' competencies based on the 2015 Council of Social Work uh, Education uh, EPAS, or Educational Priorities and Accreditation Standards. Um, each of the chapters also includes a 10-item self-assessment quiz, or multiple choice questions for students. Uh, to evaluate uh, their own uh, learning. And then finally at the end, we present suggestions for further reading uh, in a reference list that includes both uh, uh, newer research materials and uh, some, of the, some of the research classics. Uh, just a few uh, additional features of the textbook. Um, our, those who adopt our textbook will have access to PowerPoint lectures uh, for each chapter. Uh, as well as test bank questions, which are organized by chapter. Uh, these include multiple choice questions, short answers, uh, and essay questions. Um, at the end of each chapter, uh, we present, uh, again, extensive further reading suggestions organized by chapter subject. Um, as I said before, these include some of the research classics as well as new materials. Um, we also present extensive indices and reference lists at the end of each chapter. Uh, which may be helpful for students conducting individual research projects or instructors who are engaged uh, in their own research as well. Um, I want to focus just a little bit on uh, Council of Social Work Education because I know a lot of uh, program directors and instructors 
uh, are interested in, in how textbooks uh, can help them overcome uh, accreditation hurdles. Um, it's a useful uh, research, uh, sorry, it's, it's the textbook uh, is useful for program directors and individual instructors who are searching for ideas of how to evaluate uh, social work competencies. As with most texts, uh, the main focus is on competency four, which is the practice-informed research and research-informed practice competency. Uh, we also include some focus on competency nine, which is evaluation, competency two, ethics, competency three, uh, difference and diversity, competency five, which is policy practice, and finally competency seven, assessment. Uh, at the end of each chapter, we include um, an evaluating competency feature. Uh, this includes the competencies addressed in a list of thought questions designed for evaluating students' competencies. And as we stated earlier, um, exam items are also available for adopters. Uh, these include multiple choice, short answer, and essay questions designed around Council of Social Work education competencies and practice behaviors, uh, as well as the main points uh, indicated at the end of each chapter. And Peter's going to talk. This is Peter again. Um, I think I just cut Tim off. Um, I'm going to talk about the extended vignettes. Um, Tim briefly mentioned the vignettes when he was talking about the chapter features. I'm going to go into more detail on these. Um, so at the beginning of each chapter, there's a vignette that applies the concepts in that chapter. Uh, these vignettes describe a situation in which a human service professional is faced with a task or a dilemma that can be addressed through research or by employing a research technique in practice. These vignettes are designed to help students understand the utility of research methods to everyday practice situations, and in some cases, get an intimate look at applied social research. Some of the vignettes are based on interviews with human service professionals. Others are based on our own experience and those of human service professionals with whom we have spoken over the last several years, including many of our former students. So uh, one that I'm gonna talk about here is featured in chapter four, this vignette, is uh, Stephen Frazier, who works at a sexual assault recovery center. Uh, he has been asked to explore different strategies to reduce dating violence through prevention efforts. Stephen needs to first develop a research question, but how will he develop a well-built answerable research question? So there's four questions that follow uh, this vignette, and these questions are, the first one is, what different skills and resources do social workers possess to accomplish this project? The second question is, what is the first task a social worker needs to complete when starting this research project? The third one, what information is needed to build an answerable research question? And then the final question, what additional resources would be helpful to successfully formulate a well-built research question? And so this is meant to get students thinking about um, how to build a research question as they read the text throughout the rest of the uh, uh, chapter. Um, for me, what I do at the, uh, in my lectures at the end of introducing a new chapter is I will uh, give the students the vignette and have them get in groups and read the vignette and answer the question. This is a good moment for them to grasp the importance of research ideas and see how they are applied in real world settings. And I feel that it gives them a good um, starting point for each chapter. Um, practitioner profiles, we highlighted the, a couple of them earlier. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about uh, a few items with them. Um, these are based on real people and interviews. Um, my students tend to love the practitioner profiles because these are everyday people working in community agencies, applying research with people they're working with. Uh, practitioner profiles present actual human service professionals who are not professional researchers, but nonetheless incorporate research methods into their practice. The main purpose of the practitioner profile is to help reinforce the ideas that research methods 
are used to address dilemmas commonly faced in practice and that research is a core element of human service practice and not restricted to academics and other professional researchers. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the quantitative portion of this textbook. Um, this, like most um, undergrad and graduate research, research uh, texts, is uh, highly quantitative. Uh, the majority of this book is quantitative. However, the text aims to provide students with tools to apply research concept, concepts in everyday settings. This helps students understand and retain research material for years to come. Each chapter is in depth, but at the same time, not too academic for students. We cover the scientific method, measurements, sampling, survey research, data analysis, experimental design, single system design, uh, evaluation, scaling, data analysis, uh, and covering statistics. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about more about the statistics that are covered. Um, they're both inferential and descriptive statistics. Um, and then broken down within uh, these chapters, 14 and 15, is the preparation of data analysis. This is building uh, coding schemes, data entry, which has data cleaning, creating new variables, uh, graphical display and data distribution, which has your histograms and bar graphs. Uh, consideration for selecting statistics, which has level of measurement, goals of data analysis, numbers of variables, and then there's descriptive statistics, which um, has measures of central tendency, dispersion, association, and normal distribution. Uh, inferential statistics are discussed, uh, probability theory, sampling distribution, statistical hypothesis testing, and statistical procedures, um, type one, type two errors, and mean testing. Uh, the quantitative portion of this text is appropriate for both BSW and MS students. And this is a text that can be used. Um, what's nice with this is if you have advanced standing students and they have this in their, they get this in their BSW, and they may not have a research class in their in their advanced standing courses. Um, it, it this it, it it's a good textbook that could be used for either uh, MSW or BSW. Um, these chapters pull from research conducted by authors, specifically how to create a research question, design, and then follow the correct steps in research to have sound, meaningful findings. We believe that having Understanding of quantitative research is essential for social workers and practitioners in social services. The knowledge and understanding they will receive in a logical extension of goal practice, of, uh, of good practice and sound research. Through their understanding of practice and research, they'll be able to provide needed help to their agencies, communities, and clients. Okay, thanks, Peter. I'm gonna talk about this, Tim, again. I'm gonna talk a little bit about qualitative research. Um, we include two chapters on qualitative research. Uh, one is an overview of qualitative and field research methods. Uh, the second covers analysis uh, of qualitative data, including, including the use of um, qualitative analysis uh, software, including uh, uh, in vivo and such. Um, we stress parallels between qualitative research uh, and clinical social work practice. Uh, we begin with the basic point that many clinical social workers and other mental health practitioners base their ongoing assessments uh, largely and initially based on qualitative assessments of clients' appearance and behavior. Uh, we then extend this analogy, which is a little bit more than analogy, to the categorization of uh, an analysis of qualitative data. The goal here is to help students see that the logic of qualitative research very much follows the logic of clinical social work assessment. Uh, and even further, that clinical assessments use qualitative social work methods or qualitative research methods in general. Um, we also draw on research that have been conducted by uh, both Peter and myself, especially uh, my focus on ex um, the experiences and coping strategies of homeless individuals and families. Uh, the goal of emphasizing uh, my own research um, is to help students 
uh, see the origins of qualitative research and just provide some context. Where did the research come from and why uh, did the researchers pursue uh, this research? Uh, to see that it stems from a community problem um, and also to help students see the potential application uh, of research to practice. So uh, telling the story uh, of research, not just as a, as, a, as a publication, but also to say, here's where the research came from and here's what a community or a group of people or practitioners have done with this research uh, to shape the services. And we find that that's, um, that's something that uh, uh, students uh, tend to like a lot. Um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, sort of the use of uh, our own qualitative research in the textbook. Um, just to, to highlight a little bit more of uh, uh, our own research included in the, in the textbook. Um, I've included some of my own uh, uh, research as examples. Um, again, the value here is context, highlighting how research emerged um, from community dilemmas and how questions, uh, designs, and the analyses proceeded. Um, some of the examples include uh, research on homeless individuals' survival strategies, uh, peer and family relationships among the homeless, uh, parenting um, and homelessness, how, how folks parent while homeless, um, applied community research on homelessness prevention, uh, evaluation of school-based services targeting homeless services. I also provide some examples pertaining to the evaluation of career-based services uh, for youth uh, in rural areas. Okay, um, I, I'm similar, this is Peter again. I'm similar to Tim with this on uh, including my own research and the importance of it. Uh, one thing that I find by having my own research in the text is I can talk to my students about what takes place outside of that actual research project, like all the other uh, elements that go into it that you really need social work skills for. And I find that this becomes extremely helpful to my students. Um, uh, on specifics, I provide examples of my research on sexual assault prevention, domestic violence treatment for offenders. I provide an example pertaining to evaluation of these types of programs. Um, my, as my research focuses on teen dating violence, partner violence, dating violence prevention, improving partner violence interventions, uh, reproductive coercion, rural social work, and healthy masculinities. So I'm gonna talk here just a little bit about what students will get from the text. So we, we've talked, actually quite a bit about this, how they'll get you know, this research to practice understanding, applied research me methods and logic. Uh, some of the things that we haven't talked uh, too much about at this point um, are how they'll get a deeper understanding of ethical considerations of evidence-based practice. Um, one ethic that social workers are charged with is to do the least amount of harm. By understanding how to conduct and evaluate research, students will be able to effectively evaluate clients' level of harm. Program evaluation is an excellent example. Many programs may not know how well their program is at accomplishing its goal or goals. Um, evaluating the program will help them gain a further understanding if the program is helping clients and how well, or if the program may be harming clients and how they can take appropriate measures to uh, improve that. Um, as far as uh, reference material for research skills and techniques, students will learn the entire research process from learning how to build a well-built answerable question, how to determine the appropriate research design to use and why, how to prepare data, how to analyze data, and how to report findings. Students will become excellent assets to their agencies when they have these skills. Um, and the final one, the appreciation that uh, research is part of what we as practitioners do. When students work on research projects from start to finish, they're able to increase their understanding of not only how to conduct research, but gain a further appreciation for science. When students understand scientific concepts like the scientific method, the world looks much different to them. Suddenly daily events are not just magical, 
there is a reason and phenomenon behind these events. Good. This is Tim. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, from a faculty perspective, what faculty will get from this. Um, I've personally used this textbook several times. Um, I like it because it's well organized and students like it and actually read it. Um, it builds on students' intuitive knowledge of the world uh, without assuming prior knowledge of research. Um, I think the examples are probably the, the highlights, the countless examples and in in-depth scenarios as well. Uh, these applications help students better understand research concepts and allow them to see their utility to practice. Again, I, I, you know, just thinking back to our practitioner profiles, I mean, the goal there was to highlight uh, people who didn't like research, but then to show how they're able to uh, use rather sophisticated uh, research methods uh, to solve a, a, a real world problem. Uh, the idea is to, to help students see that they do have the knowledge, they do have the skills, um, and uh, they're able to better see that when they see this uh, in, a, in a practice context. context. Um, it can be used in teaching students at various levels, includes the basics, but also provides more in-depth coverage of technical aspects of research. Um, it's user-friendly, it doesn't assume previous knowledge, uh, it uses common language. Um, it's also helpful for assessment, and it's helpful for uh, us as program directors and, and instructors uh, to evaluate students' knowledge and competencies, including uh, uh, self-assessment and um, uh, accreditation related competency assessments um, and again it we, we, we um, it provides some test bank questions and powerpoints uh, which make uh, uh, which are very easy to follow and well organized so uh, for the occasions where uh, somebody has a short time to organize a research uh, course uh, this this can relieve some of that stress uh, uh, for faculty Thanks. okay that's great. Thank you, Tim and Peter. That was uh, was really interesting. There's a lot there, and I think that really speaks to the comprehensiveness of this text. Um, so we'll now be taking questions. So if you do have a question and you haven't done so already, please send through the Zoom Q&A feature. Um, we've got a couple of questions in there. One is talking um, about examples. Early on, I think Tim and Peter, you mentioned about students, you know, they, they sort of come without, with a preconceived idea of what research is, but then if they can choose topics, they, it becomes personal to them. Do you have a theme of what students want to talk about? Some sort of top, top topics? Oh, some, some of the, some of the research topics that students yeah. might be interested in? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, uh, I, you know, I'll go first. Um, I, one of the things I find, uh, and I, I imagine some of the, the people out there would find the same, is that um, this, this varies a lot depending upon whether um, students are already in field practice, uh, field placement or not. Uh, those students who are taking research either during or, or after a field placement, I think tend to have very um, sort of refined and uh, nuanced and uh, very specific research uh, foci, and and um, and I think that's that's very helpful um, because you know once they're out in practice, it's not just that I have an interest in mental health, so I want to find a mental health question. Uh, when they're in practice and and they're they've been working with clients, and you know they see that you know uh, for example um, the service system in their community. Uh, might offer mental health services for some groups of clients, but other groups of clients who may not have insurance or the right insurance uh, may not be served. And, you know, they, ha they come in there with an interest because they see this problem in practice. And, you know, they might have a question like, um, you know, uh, what's, the, what's the differential responses uh, in, our, in our community uh, between clients who are Medicaid eligible and clients who are not Medicaid eligible? Um, and, you know, that, that I think um, gets them excited about the research project, the process. Um, I think students who are earlier in their social work careers um, tend to start with something that's more general, uh, like, uh, can mental health services be effective at, you know, uh, addressing severe depression? 
Um, and I think the challenge there is to say, well, you know, that's, that's research that's already been done. Uh, and there's a lot of research. So I think your first step is to um, delve into that, uh, the, the, the research uh, literature out there. And maybe we can find something that's more specific uh, or uh, that adds a new, uh, uh, new knowledge. Um, and very often uh, what we come to is a, is a question that's a sort of a, an applied question to their specific agencies that they're interested in or the communities that they care about. Um, and so we, we, we you know, um, help them you know, hone down those questions so that uh, they're more beneficial. That's yeah. <clears throat> I agree with that, uh, with what Tim said. Um, some other things, uh, uh, with my students, I'm talking about my bachelor's students, um, they, they have two research courses, um, and their first one is really about learning the basic building blocks of research, and the second one is applying it and actually doing it. And, and so when they start in my first class, they they aren't in a practicum placement yet so they so some of the um topics tim was talking about with community they they might not be there as much because they're not in their internship and so they tend to have a little bit of more focus on students and student services and and um this actually becomes more helpful for them if they are able to do the entire project on students and, and I try to help them get there. So they might look at, hey, what does domestic violence look like among students and what are, what are mental health outcomes with that? And specifically looking at difference between LGBTQ population and, um, and heterosexual population and what, what are the services or what prevention could we do on campus uh, to reduce the, these efforts. So those, those are some th topics and some areas that I have seen. And it's the, the students are really, when they're able to do an entire project on that, I, their, their knowledge on research is just outstanding. Uh, that's, that's, really, that's really helpful. And I think that ties in with a question that we have from Brenda, which is, um, first of all, she thanks you for the meaningful presentation. Um, and is it being recorded and will it be available for later viewing? So yes, Brenda, it will. So all of this discussion is also included in that. Um, so, and I'm sure that Tim, Peter, you'll be getting lots of uh, sort of new focused questions uh, come next semester with um, pandemic and homelessness and you know, violence as well. So um, I'm sure there'll be lots of um, themes resonating with future students currently. Um, go on. You were going to respond, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it, I, I think in our in our uh, chapter on problem formulation, we, when we talk about you know, research question design, um, it really emphasizes that part of this is a student's um, sort of self exploration. You know, you might have a student who says, "I'm really interested in um, hospital social work." Um, and then, you know, that's great. Um, what can you do for a, a research project or what research question can you create? But I think, you know, uh, and Peter would probably agree with this, a, a lot of our questions to students are then, why do you care about hospital social work? And then you get into, oh, you know, uh, a, a relative or something went to a hospital and, you know, something uh, terrible happened and had this specific condition and, you know, here is uh, what I wish went better. And then that allows opportunities, I think, for instructors to um, explore it. Okay, you said something a little bit more interesting there. You're talking about a specific context. You're talking about a specific condition. Um, let's explore why that went, uh, why this outcome uh, happened. Is it about insurance? And now we have, you know, sort of more interesting and specific variables. And that's that's one of the things that we try to to get students to understand is that uh, research really comes from uh, an applied practice problem or dilemma. And, um, you know, I think they go in there thinking, nobody's interested in my very specific small world. Um, but then I think what they find is that, no, I think we are interested in your specific small world, because that opens the door to um, a new contribution to research. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's a good point. Um, 
Research question and problem formulation is, for students, they most of them have never done it before. And it's, it's a very difficult thing because you have to be specific enough that you're gonna answer it, but not too specific that you're not, you can't find anything. Um, one, one thing that I've found and that we have in this textbook is um, we talk, it has the acronym of PICO, which stands for Population Intervention Comparison and Outcome. And once the students are able to start thinking about those, okay, what is my population? If I have an intervention, what would I like to do? What would be that comparison intervention? And then what would the outcome be? They've already built in that that has built in independent and dependent variables without them having to think real hard about, okay, what's my independent variable for this question and what's my dependent variable? It, it, it really lessens the, the um, uh, fear factor that they may have around building that question and intimidation. And so, um, yeah, getting, getting to the point of having an answerable question can take a lot of uh, drafts and so forth for them to have to do, but it, it, it can help them have something meaningful. Okay. Another question from Asli. Uh, do any of the chapters touch on mixed methods and participatory research? And when are these methods, when are they introduced to students um, because they want to hear and read more about them? Oh, yeah. Yes, sorry, he says, uh, if, when these methods are introduced to students, they want to hear and read more about them. Yes, so certainly uh, in the qualitative and field research, we will we, uh, talk at length about participatory research. Um, we also, um, in, in that uh, in that chapter, we'll talk about uh, mixed methods as well, and the the value of mixed methods. Um, you know, you know, while people focus on quantitative analysis, it might tell them a little bit about the relationships between variables, but the qualitative analysis can add important context and begin to explain why things might be related. Um, and so we do we do focus that at, at least in the qualitative uh, and field research. Um, uh, chapter and also too in uh, some of the, the the earlier chapters where we're talking about types of research. You know, there's uh, experimental research, uh, descriptive research, and other things. And we talk about the um, uh, quantitative, qualitative research, uh, and and explain that there's also uh, mixed methods as well. Um, so we we do we do do that. And then I think also in our examples. Um, we do highlight uh, many instances where mixed methods are used. Okay, thank you. So you, there is a question about the other research books out there. Obviously, it's quite a it's quite a heavy area for products. Yep. Um, what would you say if someone just put you on the spot? The one difference between your book um, and the competition, every other books that other people are using. Yeah, I would say. Um, one thing is that we have not moved uh, to um, a consumption approach, meaning I, I think there have there has been some movement uh, in some programs uh, to uh, think about research as something that students consume and uh, how to consume it effectively, uh, sort of an evidence-based practice approach. Uh, this is... Um, I think in some ways a little bit more old fashioned that it focuses on the research process. Um, and I think uh, we do that and remain current and relevant um, by uh, going great to great lengths to emphasize the practice utility of research methods. Um, not just that research isn't just something you consume, research is something that you do as a practitioner and you do it to solve pretty common everyday dilemmas. Okay, so even though you, it's, it's um, appropriate for different levels going down to bachelors, it still has that practical approach without being too scary. I think, I think that's true. And, and you know, while, it's, while we do use it, uh, I, I know a lot of bachelors in social work uh, programs will use it. Um, it does, it is fairly meaty in terms of its, um, 
it, it's it's tech it has some some the technical uh, uh, nuanced uh, aspects of research and and uh, data analysis but it's also organized in such a way that um, instructors can um, can skip certain things uh, depending on the uh, the the needs of the students okay thank you um, one final question I think there's I think there's just one more um, about the data content in the book. You mentioned that there's a couple of chapters on data. How, how much is it on statistics? Would it cover the statistics separate course or would they need a separate book on that, a separate, separate content? Yeah, that's a good question. So <clears throat> it's not a statistics book. Um, how, so it doesn't get in, in depth into all different types of inferential statistics. Um, it does cover descriptive statistics fairly well. Uh, inferential statistics, it mainly has uh, ANOVA, uh, MANOVA, it has, you know, and so it has different means testing so you can get the idea of t-tests and correlations and um, but it doesn't get into regression. Um, so um, if it is needed for like heavy data, you know, supplementing a little bit in, uh, uh, if it is a stats course, you, you would probably need to supplement in a little bit more from another uh, heavier uh, stats test. But one thing that <clears throat> I've had happen quite often is I've had students that have graduated from uh, with their bachelor's in social work and they're applying for a master's degree um, and they need a stats class. And I have them, I, I've had them send my syllabus to the university that they're applying for to see if that class that they took based on this book, uh, the data analysis class, um, would would suffice their statistics um, requirement, and um, so far every every student that's done that has had that go through. Um, but saying but that saying that it 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 isn't a statistics book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say just building on that quickly, you know, this approaches um, data analysis and statistics from the from the the data collection standpoint so you know if if we're if we're designing uh survey questions um and we want to learn something right it's um emphasizing that we need to pay attention to the levels of measurement right um if we're doing an evaluation uh, uh project and we want to present data to a group of people uh, we need to think about the presentation uh, of data right uh, do we use a histogram? Do we use a bar chart? Do we use a, a pie chart? You know, uh, we need to think about the level of measurement there and those types of things. I, I, this, isn't, um, this isn't beginning with uh, sort of the logic of probability, which leads into statistics. So I think it would be a difficult uh, a text to use in place of a statistics course. However, I do think that, uh, you know, this could be uh, something um, that would at least uh, supplement a good data analysis course. Um, okay, that's, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, so I think that's it for our time. So just some concluding remarks, thanking everyone for devoting their precious time um, to the webinar. Thank you for joining us. The website is there, we'll, this will also be recorded. Um, so you can go to the website to view uh, the book and the instructor materials. And there'll also be a survey um, after the presentation where you can also request a desk copy. If there are any questions that we didn't get to, you can contact the authors. They have their emails in the final slide of the presentation. And as we close here, we'd like to wish, hope everyone stays safe and well during this unprecedented time. And thank you again to joining. Thank you also to all the essential workers on the front lines and those supporting them. We greatly appreciate you. We can get you um, uh, print copies, desk copies, but it's quicker at the moment to get you an e-copy and they're readily available. So let us know. And thank you again to Tim and Peter for leading this discussion today. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.